You can have a seat, and uh, if you would, grab your Bibles or take your Bible app on your phone or your tablet and turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 is our text for the day. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They kind of look like this. Turn to page 1051, and you will find our text today, Luke 24. That's 1051. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, then please take one of these. It's a gift from us to you. Because we believe that if you read the Bible, that, that God will change your life. And so uh, if you need one, take one. And I've had people tell me, oh, it'd be like stealing. No, it isn't, because we're offering it to you. Go ahead, help yourself. Take one and use it. My only you know, requirement is that you don't take them down to the swap meet and sell them. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, hey, I'm, I'm really excited about today, but I'm also excited about next week. Next week, we are starting a sermon series that is really designed for me. Uh, it's called How Not to Be an Idiot. And, and so I need a lot of help in that area. Maybe some of you do too. And what we're going to do is we're looking at a book in the Bible that was written by a father to his kids, hoping that they would grow up not to be idiots. Uh, and so since that's the hope of every parent in the world, uh, we're going to spend some time looking at this. It's the book of Proverbs, and we're going to look at, you know, kind of lessons, life lessons in Proverbs about how not to be idiots. And uh, if you're like me, you need that for you, and maybe you have some friends that need it for them. Either way, we hope that you'll come and, and check it out and let God kind of lead you into life uh, that way. Hey, happy Easter. I'm so glad you're here. Did you have fun getting ready for church today? You know, it's, it's kind of different than it used to be, right? How many of you grew up where Easter Sunday morning was like all decked out and special outfits and you went shopping and all that kind of stuff? You, you, did you guys grow up that way? Okay, a lot of you did. Uh, and a lot of us have chosen not to inflict that on our children or whatever. But, but I, I just got to tell you, I grew up that way and I hated it. I hated it. Uh, my mom put me in uh, these, you know, clothes of Satan. Uh, and, and they're these short pant suits, right, with a little bow tie and everything. Yeah, I mean, all the moms are going, oh, that's so cute. My wife looks at those pictures from my child and goes, oh, that's so cute. Yeah, I'm still in therapy because of that. Because uh, I have older brothers, and they're like, yeah, look at the sissy in the short pant suit, yeah. Not good. You know, and, and then uh, we have two girls, and when they were little, uh, my wife dressed them in matching dresses. <laughs> they love that, right? You know, I don't know if you have kids and you dress them the same. They always, there's one who likes it and one who doesn't. So, uh, you know, it's not, not really cool. And, you know, and, and the best part was your mom got you ready, right? She got you ready, but she still had to get herself ready. And so there you are, the, in this case, a boy who's sitting there dressed up, and mom gives that death warning that all moms are really good at, right? Well, you know what I'm about to say. Don't you get... Yeah. Which means you can't move. For like a half an hour, 45 minutes, you're just sitting there being bored out of your mind because that was the day before there was 800 channels on TV and, and self-entertainment things called iPads and everything. So, so you just sat there and you, and you just hated that. Or maybe the better part was dad sitting in the car honking the horn every 30 seconds going, come on! We're going to be late. Hurry up, because that's just joyful. <laughs> it's really hard to show up at church and uh, be ready for God then. So, hey, whatever you went through today to get here, I am glad you are here. And by the way, you look marvelous too. <laughs> just great. Hey, so my question today is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Uh, because the people involved in the first Easter definitely were not ready. They, they were not ready in the least. Uh, just think about the story. It's Thursday uh, before Easter, and Jesus gathers his 12 disciples with him to celebrate the Passover in the upper room. And this is where he instituted the Last Supper, which is what we do uh, called communion. And, and so he did that with his, his disciples, and he said to them, he told them the stuff that just blew their mind, totally shocked them completely. He said, hey, uh, one of you is going to betray me. And they're all freaked out, like, is it me? I don't, I don't want to do it. And then he said, all of you are going to abandon me. And they're all mad, and oh, I'll never do that. And then he looks at Peter, and he says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the morning. And, and see, they were not ready for the truth. Jesus told them the truth. They weren't ready for it. 
And then, and then you go on from there and, and you've got the, the women and the disciples and these other followers of Jesus who are horrified when he is arrested in the garden and he is put on trial and he's condemned and he's crucified. And, and, and some of them grieved up close near the cross and some others grieved from afar and some grieved and, and they were in hiding because they were afraid that they would be arrested next. But they were not ready for the pain of losing Jesus. And then came Easter morning, and the women went to the tomb. Do you think they were ready for what they found? Let's read the, the text and, and see how ready they were. Read this actually asking the question. Do they see, does anybody in this story seem ready? Uh, Luke 24, beginning at verse 1, page 1051. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So, uh, do you think they were ready for the resurrection? No, they weren't ready for the resurrection. I mean, think about it. The women went to the tomb to cover Jesus' body with spices, with, with ointments that would make him smell good while he was decaying. They were looking for a corpse. The, the, and the apostles, right? The women came and told the apostles, and the apostles dismissed their, their report as idle tales. In other words, they thought they had a group hallucination. Ah, women, you know, you can't, can't believe anything they tell you. That's what they did. And then Peter, you know, he, he runs and checks it out, and it says he marveled, but it doesn't say he believed. He wasn't convinced. He was just confused. See, they were not ready for the end of the story. God completely surprised them with the resurrection, even though Jesus had told them it was going to happen. Uh, they weren't ready for the end. The story ended different than their expectations. So again, I ask the question, are you ready? Are you ready for the truth? Are you ready for the truth? Because the truth is, God loves you. God loves you. It, it doesn't matter, you know, where you've been, what you've done, how you've failed, how you've rebelled. God loves you. And Scripture says that God demonstrates His love for us. And this, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is not like generic, you know, it applies to everyone else. This applies to you. God demonstrates His love for you in this, while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. God loves you. That's the truth. And the truth is God forgives you the moment that you ask Him. Scripture tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. All of it. Because I know some of you kind of think, well, God will forgive me for most of the, my sins, but there's a couple of things I've done that are way beyond that. No. God will forgive you of all your sins. All of them. Even the things that you don't want anybody else to know about, even the things you're, you're terribly ashamed of, God will take that away. He'll purify you of all your sins if you just ask Him to. That's the truth. And the truth is God wants to, to give you life and he wants to bless you incredibly. Do you know that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, that the Bible says that God is for you, so who can be against you? Jesus put it this way. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Have it overflowing. 
God wants to bless you. There's some of you that really think, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm living life with fear that if I screw up, God's just going to drop a lightning bolt on my head and, and blow everything to pieces. That is not the God that we worship. That's not the God of Easter. The truth is God loves you and he wants to bless you. And the truth is eternal life is only found in Jesus. Eternal life is only found in Jesus. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the only way. If you want access to the Father, if you want to meet God one day face to face, if you want to get to heaven when you die, then I am the only way that you can get there. Are you ready for the truth? The disciples weren't ready for the truth. I mean, uh, they argued with Jesus when he told them about the crucifixion, when he told them about the denial, when he told them about the abandonment, when, when he told them what was going to happen. They argued with him. Oh, no, Jesus, we're not going to do that. We're not going to let that happen. We're, no way, Jesus, you're wrong. Can I just tell you something? If you're arguing with God, you're going to lose. Okay, I, I mean, you might go, yeah, well, I'm pretty convinced that I'm right, and it doesn't matter what the Bible says. Yeah, it does matter what the Bible says because uh, God's right and we're going to be wrong. And, and by the way, here at Calvary, that, that's why we give these books away because we believe this is the inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. That's why we teach it. That's why we're doing the series starting next week on, on Proverbs because we want you to live a wise life listening to God and doing what he says and, and being ready for the truth because the disciples weren't ready for the truth. So are you ready for the truth? Do you, do you agree with Jesus that he is the way to eternal life? And then secondly, are you ready for the pain? Are you ready for the pain? I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but life hurts. Have you guys noticed that life hurts? Yeah, and by the way, here's just a little secret. The older you get, the more it hurts. Yeah. When I was young, no one ever told me that. Actually, they probably did tell me that. I probably just didn't listen to them because they were old people. <laughs> now I'm an old people, and I'm like, yeah, life hurts. Somebody needs to tell you guys that. Um, and it doesn't matter because you're still going you know, to do the stuff that we do. And, and here's the thing. Life is supposed to hurt. It's supposed to hurt because, you know, God created this perfect world, and he put uh, people in it, and <laughs> we rebelled against God. You know, Adam and Eve, ever since that time, it's, it's, there's been pain in the world because here they were, put in perfection. God said, here, live. You can do whatever you want. Take care of the place. Uh, enjoy it. There's only one stinking rule. Of course, it had to be a dietary rule, didn't it? <laughs> Guys wonder why you can't, you know, keep your diet rules? There it is. It's, it's, in, it's in the blood. It's in the DNA. Um, and, and ever since that day, we've been rebelling against God. And when we rebel against God, we destroy ourselves. And so we're selfish and we're self-destructive. And, and, and honestly, we hurt ourselves and we hurt others and other people hurt us. And we have to be ready for the pain. And here's the truth that may surprise you. Jesus didn't promise to take our pain away today. Now, Jesus did promise that one day he would take our pain away. It's called heaven, and there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain in that place. But that's one day in the future. But for today, Jesus is not your pain reliever. Jesus is your pain redeemer. You see, God redeems our pain. Psalm 147 says this, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's redemption. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You know what, though? We want God to prevent us from getting brokenhearted and keep us from getting wounds to be bound up. We want God to prevent our pain, and we get angry at God because he doesn't prevent our pain or he doesn't relieve our pain, and we want him to do that. And we end up saying things like, well, God, if you loved me, you wouldn't let this happen to me. God, if you cared for me, then, then you would take this pain away. God, if you really were working in my life, then, then this wouldn't have happened. And we're angry at God because there's pain. And he didn't prevent it, and he doesn't relieve it. And he never told us that he would. What he tells us is that God will redeem our pain by taking the broken pieces of our life, the shattered dreams of our life, the betrayals of our life, the failures of our life, and he'll take those pieces and he'll put them together in a way that makes our lives beautiful. 
That's redemption. That's how God redeems our life. Uh, by the way, Easter is a beautiful picture of God redeeming pain. You want to see how God works? Look at the Easter story. Uh, it begins with betrayal and abandonment and false accusations and a terrible miscarriage of justice. And then you add to that beatings and mockery and torture and then the long agonizing death of crucifixion. And all of that pain is followed by what? The triumph of the resurrection. The triumph of the resurrection. That's how God redeems our pain. That's how God redeems your pain. But get this. We only celebrate the resurrection because of the crucifixion. There is no party on Easter morning if there isn't that tragedy that took place on Friday. Now think about this. When, when the crucifixion happened, the disciples were broken and grieving. The women that went to the tomb were broken and grieving. They were all sad. They were all heartbroken. Their, their, their hopes and dreams were crushed. They, they thought everything was a failure. And then, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. And, and, and they didn't expect that. that. On Saturday, they were not out shopping for new clothes. They were not planning for Easter lunch. Hope you guys have plans, right? <laughs> they weren't doing that because they weren't expecting God to redeem the pain. But there it is. God redeemed the pain. And now what do we call that, that horrible, terrible day that Jesus died? What do we call that now? Good Friday. Yeah, nobody that, at that day on that Friday called that good. But see, when you look at the pain from the perspective of the resurrection, you see it differently. You see God redeems the pain. And in our lives, it's the same way. If you trust God with the pain, he will redeem the pain. Which means that you can't stay angry at God when it hurts. You can't stay angry at God when your life falls apart, when the tragedies happen. You don't, you don't want to give up. I know so many people who in the midst of the pain, they get angry at God and they walk away from God. I mean, Jim's testimony, he, he told you. I got angry, I walked away, I quit. And it took years for God to bring him back and redeem his pain. And that's the way it is in our lives. If we walk away from God, it, it, we, we delay the redemption. So in the pain, hold on to God. And then you'll see God redeem your pain. Now, here's the crazy thing. Uh, when I look at the, the Easter story, this is the thing that just stands out to me. If, if you read the Gospels, Jesus actually told his disciples three times, hey guys, guys, listen to me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be handed over to evil men and they're going to crucify me and on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. You got that? And they're like, nope. We don't get it. It's not going to happen, Jesus. We're not going to let you go to Jerusalem. We're not going to let you be handed over to evil men. We're not going to let you be crucified. He's like, guys, you're wrong. Here, let me tell you again. You get this? And, and he told them three times, and they still were not ready for the pain. How many times has God told you, told me, hey, I'm going to be with you always. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, uh, even when you're hurting, even when you're broken, even when you're grieving. I'm still there, and I'm going to stay with you, and I'm going to redeem that because we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. God says, I'm going to give you life. If you'll hold on to me, I'll redeem the pain. So are you ready for the pain? Because God is ready to redeem your pain. And then, are you ready for the end? Are you ready for the end? Are you ready for the, the end of the story? Or, be specific, are you ready for the end of your story? And I know right now some of you are going, that's kind of a morbid question to ask on Easter, isn't it? You kind of bring up death, that kind of sucks. I don't want you to do that. Well, hey, I got news for you. Easter is the story of death and what happens after. Okay, so it's completely appropriate to kind of bring up this question of are we ready for the end of the story? Because Jesus challenged us, same Jesus we're talking about. Matthew 24, he said this, Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. 
You see, none of us knows when the end will be. We don't know when our end is going to be. We don't know when this world's going to come to an end. We don't know when our life is going to come to an end in this world. But here's what we do know. We all know that life is fragile. We all know that life is fragile. You know, most of us in this room, we've lost somebody close to us. We've had to say goodbye, uh, you know, through the tears. And we've had to try to explain it to our kids. And and maybe we were kids and we lost someone close to us and it broke our hearts. And and we understand that life is fragile. We get that life is fragile because nowadays, uh, you know, because of the safety Nazis, everybody's got to be bubble wrapped from birth. Right? You know, car seats, I, I mean, hey. Uh, I'm of the generation that we were, if we, if we had seatbelts in the car, we didn't use them. Uh, and, and now we've come full circle because we understand, hey, we can, we can protect people. Life is fragile. So we need to be ready. We get that. So are you ready for the end? Now, we're sitting in church, so a lot of you can give the church answer and go, yes, I'm ready. I believe in God. I I hope I'll make it to heaven. I think I'm ready. See, the Bible is full of these parables that basically are are messages saying, make sure you're ready. Jesus told three of them back to back to back in Matthew 25. You've got to go home and read Matthew 25. If you don't have a Bible, take one with you. I I think I've mentioned that. And uh, so Matthew 25, he tells these stories back to back to back about people who weren't ready, who thought they were ready, and, and they missed the opportunity. So, are you ready? Uh, I kind of lived out my own parable a few years ago. Let me share it with you uh, because this happened in my life and and it just illustrates how sometimes we're not as ready as we think we are. Uh, I planned the the perfect trip. You know, Uh, we're going to spend two weeks in Hawaii. Yes, be envious. And uh, I love Hawaii. So Two weeks in Hawaii. First week, the kids are with us. We're doing all the fun stuff. You know, the ocean, the snorkeling, the beach, the waterfalls, the hiking, the zip lining. Any zip liners in here? You guys like that? So uh, zip lining, we did all that stuff. It was a great week. The kids went home. Our friends came. And we did all that same crazy fun stuff. Uh, only we got to add to it golf on these amazing golf courses. Great two weeks. We're heading home. And, and, you know, it's been the perfect vacation. We're coming into touchdown in Vegas. I look over at at my wife, and I say, honey, do you have your house key? She said, no, don't you have yours? I said, I gave my keys to the kids so they could drive the car home. We're riding home with our friends. And, and so now we're panicked. And as soon as, it, you know, you can use the electronic devices, maybe a little bit before that, we're texting the house sitter. Do you still have the keys to the house? And she said, no, I did what you asked. I locked them in the house and left because you're coming home tonight. <laughs> And then uh, we called the, you know, the neighbor that's got the emergency key because everybody's got a neighbor with an emergency key because, you know, we try not to be idiots. And he was out of town. <laughs> so we are locked out of our own house. And we're getting back in the middle of the night, so we can't call locksmith. Our friends go, we're riding back with our friends, and they go, hey, we got an extra bedroom. It's not a problem. You can stay with us. You can break into your house in the morning. <laughs> okay, that's our plan. It's not a big deal. So we roll into their driveway, we, we open their garage door, and we are hit by a wall, a wave, a tidal wave of putrescence. I don't even know how to describe this smell, but um, it, it was just uh, like we were attacked by this odor of filth and disgustingness. Uh, what had happened is their garage breaker had tripped while they were gone. And like many of you, they have a refrigerator, freezer in their garage. Yeah, and, and guess what they had put in there? A nice catch of fresh fish. Yeah, and uh, but did I mention it was July? That makes it all that much better. And so here we are trying to, you know, walk through this mill, clean up this mess, you know, disinfect the house so you can actually breathe inside of it. And... Uh, and we had the perfect trip right up into the end, and then it stunk. <laughs> so I don't want that to happen to you. Don't live your life thinking that you've got it all planned out, and it's all good, and everything's in order, and then you end up locked out and stinking. <laughs> Be ready. Jesus told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that we can't get to God except through him. So are you ready to follow Jesus? 
Are you ready to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Are you ready to commit your life to following him? Are you ready to surrender to Jesus? Because that's what it means. And understand, we're not talking about playing church. We're not talking about, uh, you know, being religious. We're not talking about being a good person. You, you already heard Jim's story about how that doesn't make it. What we're talking about is have you experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? So that you know that you're in a relationship with him. You know your sins are forgiven. You know that heaven is your destination. And you can walk out of this place going, hey, if I don't make it home, I've got a home in heaven. And I know that Jesus is going to take me there. That's what we mean by are you ready? And if you're not sure that you're ready, hey, we're going to have people here at the front, members of our prayer team after the service, come and talk to them. They'll pray with you. we got pastors at the Connection Centers. Just come and find any of us and say, hey, I'm not ready. I want to get ready. We would love to talk with you. We just don't want you to leave here not ready. Because that's a terrible feeling when you realize I blew this. I blew this, and I'm not ready. I pray that you are ready in every way, because they weren't ready for the resurrection, and I pray that you are. Let's pray.